right, I hope you have your pen and paper ready to take some notes because this is gonna walk you through the step-by-step -step process from the time you are deciding you want to buy a house until the time you're about to get the keys. So let's get started. Here's the process in a nutshell. First, you have the idea and you start setting your goals. Then you set your budget. Then you get pre-approved. You find an agent. You search for a house. You make an offer. You get the inspection done. You get the appraisal. And then you get the financing secured and you're one step closer to getting the keys. All right, so goals. You've already done this in the previous lesson. You've set your goals. You can check that off the list. The next step, setting your budget. You've done that too. You have an idea of how much you want to spend and how much house you can afford, right? Perfect. Check that off the list. So getting pre-approved. This is so important that you do this before you find a real estate agent. Let me tell you why. Getting pre-approved really sets the tone for how much you can really afford. So in the previous step, you set your budget based on how much you were comfortable with spending. But when you get pre-approved, you're basically getting a piece of paper from a lender, from a bank that's saying how much they would most likely lend to you for a house purchase. So one thing to note is getting a pre-approval letter from a lender is not binding. Just because they pre-approve you does not mean you have to go with them, and it does not mean that they will actually go with you. And I'll explain that a little later, but just know that it's not binding and you can shop around. So I suggest that you start with banks that you currently do business with, call them up, see what kind of incentives they offer, see what kind of programs they offer, and once you start calling, Call the lenders and say, hey, so-and-so bank is offering me this. Can you match that? Can you beat that? So make sure you get pre-approved before you find an agent and that agent will thank you because it's a huge time saver. It's not binding and you can shop around. Just be mindful when you're shopping around, most lenders will want to run your credit because they can give you a more accurate estimate of how much that they will lend you but the more your credit is run you know that uh, that affects your credit score so just be careful you can shop around as much as you want but most lenders will run your credit and every time your credit is run it affects your credit score okay so let's do an example of like shopping around for pre-approvals so say you call ABC Lenders and they're saying, yep, we will give you 3.8% and we can close in 45 days, right? And then say you call XYZ Bank and they're saying they're gonna give you an interest rate of 4.2%. Their closing takes 60 days because they're really backlogged with closings and they offer a cash incentive of $500. So, all right, you have two, um, quotes here, you can call a third bank and say, hey, ABC and XYZ are offering this. Can you beat that? Can you match that? So you call QRS Mortgage and they're saying, well, we can't give you 3.8, but we can give you 3.5. We close really quickly. We close in 45 days and we'll give you $500 cash. So it's really up to you which you choose. Um, these are just random examples, but say you go with QRS Mortgage um, because you want to close quickly and you like the 3.85% and plus you really want that $500 cash. So you could choose QRS Mortgage, but just remember it's not binding. This is just a pre-approval. After you've gotten a pre-approval, you're going to find your agent and that agent is going to be jumping for joy, just like this little orange guy, because they're going to be so, so excited that you already have that pre-approval in hand and you are ready to shop with a purpose, right? So there are three ways to search for your agent. You can search via referrals from friends and family. You can look on, her, you can look on home search websites. 
So that's what we've done in the past and it's worked for us. We've also worked on referrals, um, but Redfin actually is offering cash back if you use one of their agents, which is really cool. Um, that's always an option, but don't hesitate to find agents via, via these home search websites. It's perfectly okay to do that. Now, another option is you've probably seen these for sale signs as you drive around and you may see a house you want to look at and there's a sign out front with an agent's name and number. Please keep in mind that most likely that is the listing agent. That agent represents the seller. So that agent you see on the sign is called a listing agent and they represent the seller. That agent can also represent you too, but it gets tricky. Let me explain. There's exclusive agency and there's dual agency. Exclusive agency means you have a real estate agent and they represent you exclusively. In dual agency, it's kind of like what I was mentioning in the previous slide. If you have a, a listing agent that represents the seller and you also get them to represent you, it's really hard for them to have both of your best interests at heart. So while it's perfectly legal and perfectly normal to have dual agency, it can get really tricky. So if you call the agent with, that is the listing agent, just be mindful. And they'll probably ask you, are you working with someone? And if you're not, you could get into a situation where you're being represented by the listing agent. So I just want you to be aware that exclusive agency and dual agency are very different. Um, okay, so we got that. Now, you found your agent, now it's time to start looking. You can definitely search yourself on Zillow, Redfin, Trulia, whatever other home search site you want to use. Uh, I definitely always search myself and I also expect my real estate agent to send me listings from their system. The real estate agents have a different system than what we see online. Sometimes it has listings that are not yet listed online. So definitely search yourself um, and definitely look at what your real estate agent sends you. You should do both and you get like a wide spectrum, um, a wide search variety. So once you start searching, say you find the perfect place and you want to take a look at it, Here's what happens. You take a look at the place and you say, you know what? I love this. This is it. This fits my goals. It fits my budget. And I want to make an offer. So when you make an offer, be prepared for three different outcomes. A counter offer, a rejection, or an acceptance. A counter offer is fine. It's perfectly normal in a real estate transaction or a real estate negotiation. Um, you could go back and forth with the seller until you all are able to agree on something. If you're not able to agree, you may get a rejection, which is still okay. You can just move on to the next one. Now, acceptance is what everyone wants, right? Acceptance is really great. You're one step closer, but there are a few more steps you have to take before the place is yours. So once your offer is accepted, you're not free and clear yet. The place is not yours yet, but this is really exciting because just a few more steps and you're almost at getting the keys. So when you make an offer, you will tell your real estate agent, hey, I want to offer such and such amount. You may have to negotiate a bit. You may get rejected or you may get accepted. If you get accepted, Here's what happens next. Once the offer is accepted, you need to schedule the inspection. So the inspection is scheduled by you and it's when a certified inspector comes out and tries to uncover anything that may be wrong with that property. So again, the inspection is scheduled by you and it's when a certified inspector comes out and tries to uncover anything that may be wrong with that property. In the inspection, they could uncover things like mold, leaks, structural issues, water damage, or code violations. Now, the inspector may see 
mold, for instance, and say, hey, this looks like mold from my experience. You may want to get a mold expert out to look at it. And you are well within your rights to, to get that done. If they see what they think could be structural damage, they would recommend you get an engineer to come out and look at it. And you're well within your rights to get that done because you have to do your due diligence and make sure that this is something you actually feel comfortable investing in. So what the inspector will do is he or she will go around, look at the place, take extensive notes, take pictures, and give you this um, extensive readout of all the things they found. Now, after all that is done, you can take that to your real estate agent, sit down and go over it. And there are three outcomes that you can expect after the inspection. You can ask the seller to fix all of the issues, or you can take the property as is, or you can meet somewhere in the middle. You can say, hey, um, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, can you fix these three or four issues? And I'm gonna fix the rest. So you can ask the seller to fix all or some of the issues, you can take the property as is where you're like, no, this is such a good deal. I don't care. I'm going to fix all this stuff myself. Um, or you can back out of the deal with what is called the inspection contingency. Now, your real estate agent will be able to sit down with you and explain that um, a little more in detail. But just know that those are the three outcomes after the inspection is complete. After the inspection is done, and once you're all finished with that process, next is the appraisal. The appraisal is scheduled by the lender. The lender sends an appraiser out, and their primary job is to value the property. Now, the value of the property is completely different and has no bearing on the price of the property. The price is what you and the seller have agreed upon. If you and the seller have come to an agreement, after your negotiations that the price is going to be $190,000 that is all well and good but the appraiser may come out and after doing research and taking a look at the property he or she may say well this property is only worth $170,000 so although you have agreed to pay $190,000 if the appraiser says it's worth $170,000 the lender will only lend you what the appraiser says the value is. This is really, really important because if the appraiser says that the place is $170,000 and you've agreed to pay $190,000, the lender is not going to give you any more than what the appraiser says it's worth. So you would have to come up with the extra $20,000 to make up that gap. If you don't want to do that, if you're unable to do that, you can back out of the deal. Um, most people would not want to buy a property that is valued for less than what they are paying. So be mindful that the appraisal could make or break the deal. Now you can always get another appraisal. That's also something you want to discuss with your lender, discuss with the agent, and just really see if it works for your situation. But the appraisal can make or break the deal. And let me give you another example. If the uh, appraiser goes out and says, hey, this property is valued at $210,000, but you agreed to pay $190,000 for it, you still get the place for $190,000. It has no bearing on the price that you and the seller have agreed upon. But that's a great scenario because now you're buying a property that's worth more than what you paid for it. That is a real estate investor's dream. So you're basically buying a property that already has $20,000 in equity. So it's worth more than what you're paying. It already has equity. That's a really great scenario. Um, another scenario is that the appraisal will come back at like exactly the same price as, or the exactly the same value as the price that you and the seller have agreed on. Okay, so I know that's a lot of information. Um, we've gone through a lot there. Rewind if you have to, pause, take notes. So we've gotten the appraisal. You figured out, you know, what the place is worth. And if you want to move forward, say you're moving forward, full steam ahead. The very last step would be to secure the financing. So getting financing, this process is called the underwriting process. This is when the lender will really 
um, investigate your um, your credibility and see if they really want to take a risk lending this money to you. So what they'll do is they look at your savings, they look at your credit, they look at your pay stubs, all kinds of things. So they're going to ask for a lot of information and it's really important that you get all of the documents to them in a timely fashion. And I also want to note that because you'll be sending a lot of um, personal information and financial statements, a lot of lenders do have uh, secure portals that you can send that information through. While you're in this process, do not make any large purchases. Like don't go buying like TVs or things that cost like thousands of dollars. Don't take out any loans or co-sign on any loans. You could hinder this entire process or derail the process. During this underwriting process, you are really trying to prove yourself worthy for this lender to take a risk on you. So once you get the financing, then you will go to closing and you are one step closer to getting the keys. So let's go over the process one more time. You have the idea that you want to buy a house. You set your goals. You set your budget. You get pre-approved. You find an agent. You find a house. You make an offer. You get the inspection. You get the appraisal. And then you get the financing. So I hope this has really helped you. This is a step-by-step -step process. Of course, any um, anyone's personal situation could be different depending on the lender, depending on the property, depending on a variety of factors, but generally speaking, this these are the steps that you would take. Okay, I want to mention one more thing that I kind of alluded to earlier when I was saying about the lender, um, about the pre-approval not being binding and the lender doesn't have to go with you. They may not go through with this. Here's one example of a reason why a lender would decide not to give you the loan. So say you are trying to buy a condo and the condo association gives the report about the owner and renter numbers for that condo building. So let's imagine the building has a certain number of units and the condo says this many units are occupied by owners and this many units are occupied by renters. Many lenders don't want to lend money to a um, for you to invest in a property that has more renters living in the condos than owners. So if they find out that there are more renters than owners in that condo building, they may decide not to finance you for this loan. Um, that is one thing that you could run into during the closing process to look out for. So it's really good if you can get all of that information from the condo association before you get too far along in this process. Another thing um, to consider is the title. During the transfer of title, um, that's what transfers ownership from one person to another. But one of the things that could happen, which we really hope doesn't, um, would be that there is something wrong with the title. Maybe the previous owner doesn't really own the property outright. Uh, maybe, and they may not even know it. It could be like something awry with the title, but that's why you purchase title insurance and um, your real estate agent should be able to explain, explain that to you further. But I just wanted to mention um, the title, the title insurance, and also um, one of the reasons why a lender may decide not to give you the financing.